Okay, good. Then let's start uh, our seminar. Dear valued speakers and participants, my name is Ute Brockmann. I'm the Deputy Managing Director of ECONIT, the German Indonesian Chamber of, of Industry and Commerce um, here with an office in um, Jakarta and also Surabaya. I wish you a very warm welcome to our technical um, online seminar today on, on German technology in decentralization and utilization of industrial wastewater treatment. Um, we have organized uh, this event on the initiative of uh, the German um, technology company Verlo Umwelt GmbH. Uh, which is an expert company and internationally very well-known uh, provider of uh, solutions in this field. Uh, we are happy to conduct this event in cooperation with uh, Forkalin, the uh, Domestic uh, Waste Water Management Association and uh, IDWA, the Indonesia Water Association, as well as the ITS uh, Center uh, for Sustainable Infrastructure and Environment Research, um, who will all contribute their expertise to our event today. Um, we have uh, participants from Indonesian companies, of course, also several regional governments, universities um, among us. Uh, who are interested to learn more about what kind of uh, German um, solutions and technology Indonesia and its uh, environment, of course, in the end could benefit from uh, to uh, even better manage uh, wastewater, uh, especially industrial uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, let me quickly go uh, with you through the agenda of uh, the seminar. Um, which is uh, moderated by our experienced head of market entry, which is um, Ms. Olivia Noor, uh, who has uh, greatly organized this event. Um, she will later introduce each speaker uh, more in detail and also support in the Q&A session. If needed, um, she speaks Indonesian, German and English. So uh, we will start um, in the agenda with um, uh, Dr. Subspecti yeah, on, on uh, the current uh, situation of Indonesian domestic wastewater management, then going um, over to the industrial uh, wastewater management, which shall also be the focus a bit of, of this event. Um, presentation by uh, Pa Agus um, of the Indonesia Water Association. Then um, Obama will um, talk about uh, what uh, is the status of um, possible recovery of phosphate and ammonium from industrial wastewaters. And finally, um, Mr. Götz, um, the area manager Asia and Middle East of Verlo Umwelt GmbH will then introduce to German technology that uh, can be provided uh, by his company. So Verle is, is actually a uh, 160 year old uh, family owned company located in Germany, of course, and uh, also has a subsidiary in the region in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. And uh, as mentioned already, um, is uh, an expert in, in treating all kinds of of heavily polluted uh, wastewaters, such as industrial effluents or, or liquid waste, um, for example, landfill uh, leachate. So the idea of, of this seminar is uh, to inform um, you all um, who are focusing on, on waste management um, about what um, consulting, what uh, technology, what turnkey solution plans uh, can be offered um, by uh, the German company. Uh, the company has uh, more than 300 reference projects worldwide. It's, it's very uh, uh, well networked uh, throughout the globe um, with projects uh, in Indonesia, um, has already delivered three turnkey landfill leachate treatment plants, uh, which is in Jambi, Malang and Sidoajo. Um, 
Frau PT äh, Peng Bang Hunan, äh, Peruma Han, äh, State on Enterprise. Uh, but of course, Vale is also looking um, for um, entering into private private corporations um, and expand its, uh, its uh, experience in Indonesia. However, let's start now with the, the current situation in Indonesia in, in wastewater treatment in the municipalities, yeah, and then uh, later see what are the challenges on the industry side yeah, in terms of the reuse of wastewater. And uh, background against it all is, of course, that um, there are potential risks in the future of limited water resources, um, not in, only in Indonesia, but also elsewhere in the world. So I wish you a very interesting, uh, enriching seminar today. And I now hand over to our moderator, uh, Ms. Noah. Uh, please, Olivia. Thank you very much, Ms. Brockman. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's online seminar with the topic on German technology in decentralization and mutualization of industrial wastewater treatment in the focus of Indonesia. My name is Olivia Moore from the um, Head of Market and Free Service at the German Indonesian Chamber of Industry and Commerce, also known as Econit in Indonesia. Today, I will be your moderator during the online seminar. Before we start the session, I would like to point out that you can submit your question at the end of the presentation using the chat box. Simply uh, type in your question, name of the speaker you would like to ask, and your question will be read out later um, during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This online workshop is also recorded for internal purposes only. Um, and the presentation material will be sent to the person, uh, to the participant after the online seminar. So, firstly, before we start, I'd like to introduce you shortly uh, our speaker profiles today. Um, we have here Werner Umut GmbH as the initiator of this online seminar, um, represented by Mr. Groves. Um, Simon Goats as, um, as Area Manager Asia and Middle East, uh, based in Baden-Württemberg, Germany. Uh, Mr. Goats also started his career at Rebel GmbH in 2009 as a project engineer for the Asia area and has been interested as well a manager for the Asia and Middle East region since 2018. So, so far, Wilma has worked on several leach equipment projects in Indonesia, such as Jambi Malang and Sidoradro, together with the Pepe. And in this seminar, we also invite Mr. Subekti from Fortalin Association, who previously, uh, previously held the position of Executive Director of Association Indonesian Drinking Water Company, or well known as Propansi, also worked as General and Finance Director of PDAM. Also here, we are inviting um, Mr. Agus as the chairman of the Indonesian Water Association, or known as IDWA, who is also currently an operational director for the chemical company in Indonesia. And we have also Ms. Varma Dewanti from ITS University, who also leads the ITS Center for Sustainable Infrastructure and Environment Research. So uh, again, welcome and thank you in advance for your participation in this online seminar. Before we start with the presentation, we will start conduct a short play. Please put your answer on the question that appear on your screen right now. And then we will leave it open for one minute to see the result. Still collecting the result. Fifty six, fifty seven percent voted. Okay, 
So um, now the poll question is closed with the most response of the 49% uh, of the audience want to know about the industrial waste water technology, while um, the rest of the audience would like to increase the knowledge and um, having difficulties in treating the industrial waste water. They have uh, some of them uh, have upcoming have upcoming industrial wastewater project, and then the rest would like to have available substances in the floor on to use. Okay, so now I will have over the session to Mr. Subekti from Fakarin Domestic Wastewater Management Association, who will present information on the challenges and strategies towards the improvement of Indonesia's waste system. This is Mr. Subekti, the session is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Maybe I will speak in Bahasa better, I think. So, or, or mix Bahasa in English. So, today I will present about the domestic wastewater infrastructure challenges in Indonesia. And, uh, is it okay, my voice? Yes, it's okay. It's okay, Mr. Beckley. Please continue. Uh, this is my uh, background of education and works experience uh, 15 years uh, i am i have uh, experience in water related as a thinking water company uh, executive director of the water association also the uh, <clears throat> jakarta wastewater water company so this is uh, this is my experience in thinking water next You can control presentation by yourself. Okay, this is the target. This is the target. So, <clears throat> if you are talking about the uh, domestic wastewater uh, in Indonesia, this is uh, very, very challenging, actually. So, if we are talking improved sanitation, still 77. Point uh, 39 percent this is very very low still very low say. and safely minutes still uh 7.5 percent safe three minutes is uh all the uh all the waste is must be uh treated so this is the target of the national target 2024 that's the uh, improved sanitation must increase uh from 77 percent to 90 percent it means uh, must serve more 30 more million inhabitants or around 7 million houses. This is a huge number in five years. So safety minutes also, this is a, uh, uh, mostly safety minutes is a uh, uh, very small number in sewerage, around 2% now national number and will be increased 15%. Uh, Maybe sewerage is a uh, half of 15%. And the rest is uh, by uh, fecal slot management. So ODF will be decreased 77.6% uh, to 0%. And this is the challenges for the uh, domestic wastewater uh, now. And we know that the, the, the wastewater is a very, very compact issue. Compact issue. Uh, this is not only financial technical aspect also we we uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a, a culture aspect uh, mindset this is this is very complex so uh, this is uh, the current condition actually uh, indonesia there are uh, 514 regencies and cities and uh not all not all the regency or cities has a uh, treatment so this is also the opportunity only 281 uh, regencies have uh, uh, slab treatments this is by the the uh, on-site system and only 13 cities have a, a off-site facility and now under construction there is four so it means the cities have uh, facilities of the off-site only uh, 17. 
So this is a very, very small number actually. So this is a very big opportunity and on site or off site. Uh, yeah, this is the market. So last January, so government announced to, to have a, a bidding for the Zone 1 in, in Jakarta, Zone 1 in package 1. This is for the wastewater treatment plants. And uh, this project, Zone 1, Zone 1, so Jakarta is divided by uh, 15 zones. And this is as uh, zone one. Uh, zone one's the the size of the project is around seven hundred fourteen million uh, US dollar projects, or around ten trillion rupiah. So uh, the capacity is two hundred thousand meter cube per day, and the technology is uh, by the MBR, the membrane. So this is the first package. So the zone one is divided by uh, six packages. Uh, four packets uh, tender by the central government and two packets uh, tender by the, the uh, Jakarta government. So uh, this is the market is, I think the market is uh, very, very good growing. So, yeah. sorry. Okay. Besides zone one, uh, there are zone six, zone two, zone five, and zone eight. Zone six, so zone one and zone okay. six, the financing is already settled. Financing by the uh, Japan loan. So uh, I think this is uh, okay. So zone two and zone five uh, and zone eight. This is the government of Jakarta already puts this project becoming the uh, strategic uh, projects, local government strategic project. So I think this is a uh, uh, very, very good markets, uh, growing markets and a very huge uh, investment actually. You know, zone one is around 700 uh, millions uh, US dollars. So soon, Zone six is uh, around above uh, seven hundred uh, uh, million dollars. So we know that's a Jambi, Jambi, Makassar, Palembang, Pekanbaru, so under construction. So Batam also uh, uh, under construction now. Um, so we know that uh, Pokor, Bekasi, Semarang, and other cities uh, now preparation for the sewage. So. Uh, the market of the sewage is uh, growing, and this is uh, becoming uh, becoming uh, a good opportunity for the private company to have a uh, uh, start business in, in Indonesia because the the project is a very interesting project for next ten years, I think. Uh, yes, uh, this is the challenges actually. We know all that uh, sewage is high investment. Uh, so take a long time to construct. So that's why this is not uh, not sexy as a politician because uh, the constructor may be uh, longer compared with the period of the uh, uh, local local government uh, leaders. So this is uh, not uh, as sexy as a politician. So. The third is a high complexity. So as my experience in Jakarta, the, the infrastructures uh, undergone is very, very complex. So we 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 facing a, a very, very uh, difficult situation with the, all the infrastructure in uh, in uh, undergrounds, undergrounds like the telecommunications, electric, uh, electricity, uh, and gas uh, drinking water. So this is a very, very complex. So <clears throat> also, also number uh, the fourth is takes a long time to utilize. So we know that the maybe uh, this is not like the drinking water. With water is different. So, uh, 
mostly mostly uh, houses in Indonesia, all the septic tank is behind the house. So if we construct the, the pipe in front of the house, this is uh, not easy to, to connect the house. So this is one of the situation in all Indonesia. So that's why to take the uh, connection is take a long time. So financially it's not feasible, but economically, economically yes, feasible. But uh, this is, uh, uh, we have to secure in long-term financing because this on uh, McDonald's study in Jakarta, the tariff, the tariff is just only cover uh, 60, 64 percent operating and maintenance cost. So it means for the operating maintenance cost, the Chaka, the government must be subsidy. So this is uh, uh, the fun, uh, situation of, and we know that the, all the local government is, uh, if we are talking about the subsidies, doesn't interest about uh, this, uh, this this issue. So. <clears throat> Uh, this is the, the the characteristic of the sewerage. So, yes, uh, this is the challenge: is uh, water and wastewater law. Uh, yeah, because uh, the construction takes a long time and the high investment. So, this is my view: that water and uh, wastewater must be have the own law. So, two to secure for the long-term investment. This is the, the challenge, the regulation. The second is institutional. Institutional. Um, yes, by, by law now, uh, water and wastewater is responsible by the local governments. But the, we know that the uh, local capacity of the fiscal in, in, in local government is different. So, for example, uh, in the previous presentations, uh, government or government, central government or already uh, built the 281 slot treatment plant, but the only around 30 percent is operated well. So this is this is why because the uh, limited uh, budget for the local government. So this is the the situation of the institutional. Uh, Financing, yes, uh, financing is one of the issue, but uh, this moment, government have a policy to combine drinking water and, and uh, wastewater. So the combined, uh, like the Malang and the Palembang, the combined drinking water and the wastewater, this is uh, one of the uh, solution for the financing because the drinking water so financially is feasible and can subsidy for the uh, wastewater and the other hand this is not only technical but also the uh, mindset all the people all the people mindset of the uh, politician mindset of the uh, community so must be changed because the uh, Wastewater is a, we are talking about the culture. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is the example of the technology uh, for the slot treatment in Indonesia. There is a uh, Bali uh, mixing tank, so you can you can you know all the this kind of technology. So mostly. Uh, we are using the the, the the technology, the low technology actually. So, and, oh, sorry, this is the same. And uh, I will show you that's the, mostly the characteristic to choosing the technology. The first is the land availability. Like in Jakarta, Jakarta is not on the, uh, uh, this is uh, very difficult to looking for the land for the wastewater. So that's why uh, the technology must be fit with the land availability. So the second is uh, the low operating cost. Yeah, 
the low operating cost means uh, we we can uh, secure for the sustainability of the uh, wastewater treatment plants. So number the, of investment, yes. Uh, number four is easy to operate. So mostly, mostly uh, wastewater is uh, still not sexy, uh, sexy uh, infrastructure. So so that's why uh, mostly the operator also the the capacity is low. So that's why uh, the low technology easy to operate. This is, is one of the criteria to choosing the, the kind of technology. So this is uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you. Terima kasih. If you have uh, any difficulty with my voice, my English is, uh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Mr. Subekti, for the main overview uh, of the sewerage system in Indonesia. Um, it can be seen that Indonesia still needs a proper wastewater treatment system, and only 30% of wastewater treatment plants are working properly. Um, the construction structure in Indonesia, which is also quite complex, is certainly a big challenge for the industry in Indonesia, especially in the current pandemic situation with uh, the limited financial um, um, support, uh, but there is still a big opportunity for private companies to do the project in Indonesia because there are still in other great facilities like this in Indonesia. So um, it can still be seen as a long-term business opportunities, especially for foreign companies to join. Now, I uh, would like to hand over the next session to Mr. Agus from IDWA, Indonesian Water Association, who will present information on the situation in wastewater management and industrial site. Yes, Mr. Agus, the session is yours. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me in this webinar. Uh, my name is Agus Mariasin. I'm the chairman of the Indonesian Water Association. Uh, today, I would like to share a little bit of uh, information about current situation in the real wastewater management in Indonesia. As we know, Indonesia, the world's fourth most populated country, with over half of the population lives in cities. By 2045, the centenary of Indonesia independence, nearly three quarters will. And year 2020, water supply in Java Island is about 1,200 meter cubic per capita per year. For this amount of the total water, only 35% is economically feasible to be treated as clean as water supply. So its actually potency is only 400 meter cubic per capita per year. It is for much lower the minimum requirement suggested by the United Nations, that is 1,000 meter cubic per capita per year. It's classical reason that the high number of population is the main cause of the water supply deficit. The land conversion from agricultural and forest land to other forms has been increasing, so that the water resource has been decreasing. In average, about 50,000 hectares of agriculture land is covered into non-agricultural land generally. Thus, the limited source of clean water that can be identified by the community and industry requires qualified water waste or wastewater treatment management. So, uh, several regulation in water management and its pollution treatment have been made by the government of Indonesia. The implementation, however, still needs to be firmly enforced at all costs. Based on the law number 32, year of 2009, the definition of waste is the residual of the business of activity. Waste are divided into two main parts, namely hazardous and toxic waste waste, uh, as we know as a B3 and non b waste. B3 waste source from the specific source derived from the main activity of industrial processing, not specific source that don't come from the main activity, as well as other source of B3 waste derived from the unexpected. While the non b three waste source are domestic waste, agriculture, and some industrial waste. 
waste come from the various human activities such as the material that is no longer used. Waste is generated from the industrial activity and domestic activity. Following the described in several source of waste, number one is uh, mining, energy and mineral industry, infrastructure and services industry, agro-industrial sector, manufacturing industry, and domestic of waste. Mining, energy and mineral industry. Mining activity become a significant contributor to liquid waste. The development of this sector industry has increased waste problem. The sorting process use of a lot of water process in the river. And since in traditional gold finding, it immediately dumps the waste into the river without prior processing. As well as in the coal mining, waste in the form of flood coal from coal contains toxic metals, which are far more dangerous than the purification process of gold mining using the cyanide. This carcinogenic element, when, when mixed with river water and used by the community continuously, will degrade river water quality and cause a variety of serious health problems. And currently, in oil fields, daily water production from oil wells spread roughly three barrel water fluid per day per barrel of oil. Also, some wells produce significantly higher amount. It costs money to lift water and then dispose of it in well producing oil with 80% water cut. The cost of handling water can be double normal lifting cost. The infrastructure and service industry, including health sector such as a hospital, are one of the hazardous waste producing source. The waste produced contain many bacteria, virus, chemical compounds and drugs, and that can be in danger to the health of the surrounding community. But however, the limited number of the medical waste treatment services compared to the number of hospitals in Indonesia cause the accumulation of medical waste in some regions. According to the Ministry of the Forestry, currently only six medical waste treatment services with a total capacity of 134.4 tons per day. Whereas the total estimate medical waste generation reached 366 tons per day, with only 86 hospitals out of those 2,813 hospitals that have incinerators that meet technical standards which are capable of processing 68 tons of medical waste per day. The agro industry sector also produces water waste from the agricultural process, whether in the process of pre-harvest, harvest, and post-harvest. Whereas the CPO and other CPO production in the same year reached the 22.76 million tons. Each ton of fresh fruit process produced 150 up to 200 kilograms of CPO, but also removed liquid waste palm oil will affluent around 600 to 700 kilograms, 230 kilograms of empty oil bones, and 190 kilograms of fiber cell. So this waste contains extremely high organic material, so that the level of the contamination material will be higher. And now mostly palm oil industry is located in the river, and its wastewater will form ammonia which will threaten aquatic biota and cause all the fall odor. Uh, manufacturing industry, the shifting of the population consumption to non-food consumption indicates the increasingly diverse kind of the need of Indonesian population. This triggered by the development of the manufacturing industry and growing number of the new industry. Number of large industrial companies in year 2000 as many as 20,000 companies increased to 26,000 in year 2015. And one of the four companies was the food processing industry, then followed by the textile and apparel industry. Added by the large number of micro small industry in Indonesia, in year 2010, it reached 2.7 million business, 
and the five-year period become the 3.6 million units in year 2015. Where that produced the by factory was dumped into the waterway, such as deep river banks or river and ends at sea. So there is a dangerous liquid waste, uh, and some other can be neutralized quickly. Waste which is discharged into the untreated waterway because damage water ecosystems, even living things and food types. So uh, as we see in the slide, based on the DPS, by the Statistic National, uh, mining energy and mineral industry of uh, a measure of producing liquid waste and P3, and then followed by the infrastructure services industry, agro and manufacturing industry. So this is the last slide. So here's the main challenge in industrial waste water management. For existing water water treatment facility, one of the main challenge is the, the lack of the technical capability to operate the waste water treatment facility and address technical issues that arise. Also, for some industrial process water, the use of waste water treatment technology is inadequate to properly treat the drain waste water. At present, some of the industrial waste water treatment facilities are under capacity and some are capable of fitting the required of quality the influence. And for the new facility, some industries have difficulty gaining access for funding for their waste water treatment facility. Okay. Uh, that's all my sharing for all of you. Thank you. But if you have any question, you can write me on the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Argus, for the um, important information from the industrial side. So we yes. can see that 91% of the hazardous waste is produced by mining and mineral yes. industry. This is obviously yes. a big problem, especially since it can pollute our rivers and um, if it's not processed properly and correctly. So, uh, and also in addition, uh, textile, F&D, agro industries, and even hospitals yes. also produce large amount of liquid waste. This then show us again the um, how important wastewater treatment uh, in Indonesia. Well, yes, um, thank you very much, Mr. Argos. Um, if yes. someone has a question, um, they can address. Um, you can address your question later on at the end of the presentation uh, using the chat box. Okay, now well, I would like to uh, invite Ms. Roma Dewanti from ITS University with the topic of recovery of uh, phosphate and ammonium from industrial wastewater. Please, Ms. Roma Dewanti, the session is yours. Okay, thank you very much for Ibu Olivia Noor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, uh, as already mentioned by Ibu Olivia, because I come from ITS and you can call me Wawa. As a researcher, I would like to share about the result of the research about recovery of phosphate and ammonium from industrial wastewater. Previously, that you see the Pak Subakti and also Pak Agus already mentioned about the challenge in a, a minutes of the wastewater from the domestic and also industry. You can imagine how much of the wastewater that produced in our country, especially in Indonesia. And for me itself, uh, the background of my study is about recovery of the phosphate and ammonium from wastewater because we are know that phosphate and ammonium are essential nutrients for our life. And also, based on the many research that already conduct since 1990, they already mentioned that percent depletion of reserve for phosphate uh, is always decreased time by time. On the other hand, hey, the phosphate consumption is also increased, mostly uh, used as a uh, fertilizer. This is why then many industries try to recovery of this uh, phosphate and also together with the ammonium uh, from um, many different types of wastewater, including from industrial wastewater, such as from anodizing aluminum wastewater, fertilizer industry, faulty manure, saline industrial, aquaculture, and also from semiconductor wastewater. 
The process that usually use for the recovery of the phosphate and ammonium, usually they use the precipitation process by added uh, several different precipitation agents such as calcium, magnesium, iron, and aluminum. And other than that, they also uh, conduct the crystallization process. Uh, sometimes they will be add uh, seeding material to enhance to get the crystal and also by the recirculation of wastewater also to increase the size of the crystal. For precipitation itself, several uh, important factors is uh, very, very uh, important on successful of recovery of the phosphate and ammonium from wastewater, such as mixing. This is the energy gradient as a driving force for the process. The second one is the pH range. For recovery of the phosphate and ammonium itself, the pH range usually will be optimum under range pH of 8.5 to 9. This is because of the characteristic of phosphate and ammonium itself. Other than that, because this is the chemical reaction, so molar ratio is a very, very important. And because we work with the real wastewater, they not only contains of the phosphate and ammonium, but they contains other ion. For example, from fertilizer industry, we can get uh, many difference of uh, other ions present in the wastewater, such as silica, such as uh, fluoride, and also sulfate and calcium itself. So it's why then they will be uh, have some impact on recovery of the phosphate and ammonium. Based on several research that already conducted, the molar ratio is uh, really important. And also the pH range is really important uh, to avoid the, the effect of the percent of other ions. And for myself, my work, usually we try to recover of the phosphate from uh, industrial wastewater by produce of hydroxyapatite uh, by added of the calcium salt. And other than that, we also try to recover of the phosphate together with the ammonium by produce of magnesium ammonium phosphate, and we added the magnesium salt, and we produce the product that call it struvite. Struvite known very well around the world because they are a slow release fertilizer and the price is also quite high. So it's why then so many people try to recovery of ammonium and phosphate together from the wastewater. Since 2005, I worked with the semiconductor wastewater for the first time to recover of the phosphate and ammonium from this wastewater. Because at that time, uh, I study in which the country they produce a lot of semiconductors. So it's why then they generate also a lot of semiconductor wastewater. And the second one, when I come back to Indonesia, because there is no semiconductor uh, company near my region, so it's why then I moved to the fertilizer industry that also uh, the wastewater contain high concentration of phosphate and ammonium. For the semiconductor itself, we uh, because we are uh, work in another country, so it's why then at that time we can see that uh, the wastewater that generate from each of unit production, for example, in the semiconductor they have the like aging process and also planarization process, then they will be produced a different type of wastewater. For example, they contain of acid base and also contain high concentration silica and also uh, contain high concentration of fluoride. They will be separate the piping system and they will be treated so they don't mix of their wastewater. So it's why then it's very easy to recover for example, in here we recover of the fluoride and phosphate from the wastewater, okay, with the selective separation process. And other than that, also we recovery of the phosphate and ammonium as a struvite from semiconductor wastewater. And right now, this uh, activity already implemented in the uh, scale of the pilot plan in uh, some of the uh, semiconductor industry. But then when I come back to Indonesia, uh, the case is different because we are work with the fertilizer wastewater. And here they have a different unit of the production process. The first one is nitrogen fertilizer unit, the second one phosphate, and the third one is sulfate acid unit. Of course, the wastewater will be have the different characteristic. But after that, all will be mixed together 
and the treatment process they just only inject by lime and also add it of the uh, stripping to remove of the ammonia of course the concentration of phosphate fluoride and ammonium is still high in the effluent so it's why then we try to recover of the phosphate fluoride and also ammonium from the wastewater for phosphate itself because in this industry they also produce of the gypsum so gypsum the sludge gypsum they contain of the calcium salt so it's why then we are added to the wastewater from the phosphate fertilizer unit and also we are uh, added from the wastewater that contain a high concentration of fluoride and this is the characteristic of the gypsum waste that we already analyzed by using SEM and ADX. And we can see here the high uh, peak of the calcium at, uh, in the uh, gypsum. So it's why then we can use as a precipitation agent. And other than that, we also added of the magnesium salt, try to recover of ammonium and phosphate from the wastewater. The result we can see from here that for the uh, calcium, especially we added of the gypsum uh, waste uh, to the uh, wastewater, and we can see the most dominant uh, precipitate that form to recover of phosphate is hydroxyapatite, and they can use for many different purposes. And we can see here, this is based on the SEM and also based on the XRD result, the peak of the hydroxyapatite is uh, the dominant, but of course we still have some of the impurities in there because we work with the real wastewater other than that this is true fight sorry okay we also conduct by the uh, uh, batch uh, uh, experiments and we added of the magnesium salt we can see the molar ratio and ph has a, a big impact on struvite precipitation and again we can see the high peak of the struvite in the XRD, but still some of the uh, impurities found because uh, we work with the uh, real wastewater as I mentioned previously. After that, we are continue by using the continuous system. We are use the crystallization process in here. We are use fluidized bed reactor, a little bit, uh, sorry, a little bit big reactor like this one and we get the a little bit big crystal because we are added the shading material and also do it the recirculation of the wastewater we use the uh, shading material by added sand and also silica sand you can see from this picture the uh, before the use and after use so we can get the uh, color of the uh, precipitate is a uh, uh, color of the crystal is white so this is a proof that uh, also struvite can find in the uh, uh, attached in the seeding material. Okay, then this is uh, again the, the result. We can see that uh, struvite is the dominant in the uh, uh, XRD result, but still some uh, uh, impurities is also included, uh, like a bobiorite, another magnesium phosphate precipitate, and also uh, uh, we can see uh, like a brucite that also found in the uh, precipitate. Based on this uh, result of the study, we try to uh, come up with the conceptual treatment process, how to recover of the phosphate and ammonium from the fertilizer industry. So the effluence of the concentration of phosphate and ammonium will be decreased and we also can get the valuable material. For example, in here, because as I mentioned to you, they have a different unit of the production process and they have the different characteristic of the wastewater. So it's why then uh, we are suggest that we, we not need to mix the uh, wastewater together, but first we can treat it like this one. We can edit the gypsum waste utilize the gypsum waste that produce in the production process also to uh, precipitate of phosphate and then also precipitate of the fluoride. Uh, after that, uh, okay, we can mix of the wastewater because this is uh, excess concentration of ammonium, but the phosphate concentration already decreased because for the struvite precipitation, as I mentioned to you previously, the molar ratio is very important and excess concentration of uh, ammonium is also important for uh, precipitation of struvite. 
then we can edit the magnesium salt try to reduce amounts of uh, ammonium and phosphate and the effluent and also recover of the uh, struvite. So this is the conceptual treatment that we can uh, offer to the fertilizer industry if they would like to recover of their uh, wastewater, especially for the phosphate and ammonium. And the last, this is about the economic point of view because many researchers already investigate the uh, economic uh, feasibility of the struvite and there are mentions that uh, these uh, plants usually for the uh, struvite uh, they mentions that uh, based on the economic point of view this is very feasible of struvite recovery process as a clean and eco-friendly technology at the plant level so this is also can be uh, used in the plant level and this is very important for sustainable nutrient management. And for the last slide. Right now, I still work with the. Uh, I still work with the CSTR, or complete steroid tank reactor. Also try to. Uh, try to recover of the phosphate and ammonium, but using a different method. Okay, uh, using a, a little bit simple method than uh, fluidized bed reactor. So we, we hope that we can find a good result for this uh, research. And for the conclusion, uh, for my talk today, as I mentioned to you previously, that several different methods can be used for recovery of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, such as precipitation and crystallization. And the important factor, a molar ratio, pH, and uh, mixing as an energy gradient and percent of other ions. And the challenge in Indonesia especially, because mostly in the industry, we will mix our wastewater. And this is caused the fluctuated characteristic of the influent for recovery process. So this is, will be the limitation because the reactor usually, or the treatment process usually, they will be have some limitation for the criteria design. So if they are too high for fluctuation of the characteristic wastewater, so must be very difficult. And the last one, because we would like to sell our recovery product. So the purity of the product is really, really important. Okay, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And I give back to Ibu Olivia. And after that, if you have any question, we can discuss each other. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rada Wamada Wanji, for the quite complex and completed information on the conceptual treatment process for recovering phosphate and ammonium. Um, it can also be seen now that the condition of the mixed wastewater is also an obstacle in uh, processing of the uh, wastewater itself in the industry. So uh, now, before we hear uh, the solutions offered by Rerla, we would like to conduct a short polling again. So please fill your answers on the question that appear on your screen. We will leave it open for one minute to get the result again. Polling is now started. Still holding. Forty four, forty five percent voted. So the question is Do you have an existing industrial wastewater treatment plant in your manufacturing facility? Please select one of the options available. So uh, now we have the results. So about 59% of the audience uh, do not have an uh, industrial resource treatment plan in their manufacture. Um, only 23% of the audience uh, do have, they do have industrial wastewater treatment plan in the manufacture, but needs to be upgraded. So the next question, we will also have um, another short polling. 
the question is, what is your financial priority for choosing an industrial influence treatment plan? Please select one. So short footing, and then we will start with the web presentation. Still collecting. Still collecting. What is your financial priority for choosing an industrial? Effluent treatment plan. So now we have to research about 65%. Um, well, the most important response is as low as possible cumulative investment and operation is the most important thing um, as a financial uh, issue. While um, only 14% uh, low as possible operation costs. Okay, so um, now to close this polling session, we will invite Mr. Goltz from Bramble to explain the best solution for Indonesian industry in terms of wastewater treatment. So please, Mr. Goltz, you already got the questions, uh, I'm sorry, answers from the polling. So um, basically, you know more or less uh, now the situation of uh, the participants we have today. Please, the session is yours. Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Olivia, for the warm welcome and um, welcome to all participants also from my side. Um, very interesting um, answers, I have to say, um, which gives us um, further ideas about the uh, uh, industrial wastewater market in Indonesia. So before um, I start uh, to go in detail, I would like to highlight some facts about uh, the company Verle, where I'm working in. It's located uh, in Germany. Uh, as you can see, it uh, is a 1800. Uh, it was founded in 1860, so nowadays more than 160 year old company. And as you can see here in the picture, it's uh, located directly um, in the town center. So because Verle was built first and then the, the city was built around um, the company. So this is why sometimes when visitors coming to us, they are a bit confused because usually these kind of um, uh, industries are outside of the town. However, Verle is directly uh, in the heart of the city. Um, we are active um, worldwide in five continents all over the world with nowadays more than um, 300 and 40 references. Um, we are coming from the, the liquid waste sector. So um, our core business is the treatment of uh, landfill leachate. Leachate is the liquid which accumulates under um, a landfill site or a dump site, which is one of the harshest and most toxic liquids you can find um, all over the world. So this is our, our core business. And from that perspective, we also started more than 10 years ago, the industrial um, wastewater treatments because the benefits which applies for a landfill uh, client also applies for industrial client and which are those benefits uh, I will come later on to it. Um, nowadays we have around 220 employees we are 100% family owned nowadays uh, in the seventh generation of the family. Our equity ratio um, is more than 50% and our annual turnover is around 40 million US dollar per year. 
Um, Viale covers actually three divisions. We have the en energy technology division, which is uh, dealing and handling with, for example, waste incineration boilers. Um, they do the design uh, for waste incineration boilers, um, boilers, uh, also steam boilers up to 160 bar. So we have extremely high qualified welders. Um, those boilers get manufactured in our in-house manufacturing, which you can see on the right hand side of this slide. And in the middle part of that slide, you see the, the division where I'm uh, acting in. It's the environmental technology dealing with all kinds of high strengths and uh, strongly polluted wastewaters. Um, if we talk about industrial effluent treatment, we are not only uh, looking into the, the, the effluent itself, which comes out of the industry, we also do a water mapping. That means we are looking into the industry and we are looking um, inside of the industry which stream can be treated effectively and which stream can be maybe um, or has to be discharged directly and the overall uh, goal of such a water mapping is to achieve uh, a reduction in the in the overall uh, water footprint because as everybody know uh, water is a, um, a element which is uh, uh, not, uh, how can I say, which will be not always uh, present in the world. It's a, a reducing element and therefore uh, tremendous efforts has to take place um, nowadays and also in the future to reduce that um, water footprint. So as I said already, we are looking into the company and why we are doing this um, will be shown in this slide here. So. There are actually um, two kinds of on-site effluent treatment. There is, we call it the normal on-site effluent treatment and we call it what is Sverle doing, the smart on-site effluent treatment. So many um, competitors, they are collecting all wastewater streams occurring in an industrial um, factory because that factory usually they have many different wastewater streams with different pollutions. So they collect all and in the end through this collection they have a mix in concentration concentration, but they have a really high hydraulic flow rate then since they are collecting them. So that means the wastewater treatment plant has to be built rather big because that high hydraulic load. What Verle is doing, which you can see on the right hand side is through the um, water mapping, we are investigating which wastewater stream inside a factory is the most polluted one. And we are going into this stream and treat this. Because if you treat only that high polluted stream, you have the big um, benefit that the flow rate there is rather small. That means you have a, a rather small hydraulic capacity and therefore to build an industrial wastewater treatment plant with a smaller capacity, but with a high loading. But in the end, if you mix then combined with the other flow rates, you are achieving the effluent discharge standards and therefore your plant will be built much smaller and also you will get a more attractive operational cost through a smaller plant. So here we see um, different pictures of our plant. So that are probably um, different from what you are normally um, have in your mind. If you are thinking in a in a wastewater treatment plant, you you probably think in big lagoons and big uh, clarifiers. So the Verle plants are really famous for their compact design, more vertical, um, not that much in the horizontal way because land is getting uh, a part which gets more and more expensive all over the world. So um, we are building one of the most compact plants in the world. And that allows us also that we are building the plant directly on site. So it don't has to be uh, centralized some where out it can be directly decentralized built next to the factory so in the middle picture here um, the biggest picture here we see a plant from from Cadbury um, this is a plant in Bucharest and we can see that this wastewater treatment plant is directly located uh, in a neighborhood area directly to the industry. So that is a clear sign that our plants are working really environmental friendly. There is no odor, no smell. And on the other hand, as you can see here on the left side, really high 
vertical reactors. Another point is Verle works uh, with external uh, um, ultra filtration membranes, not with the submerged type. Uh, why we are doing this, we will see um, later on. So here we see um, uh, the Verle patented biomembrane MBR system. So this we call is our um, working horse because it's really robust and this is a really important thing which uh, needs to be considered by building an industrial wastewater treatment plant. It has to be a robust system because in industrial uh, effluent the wastewater concentrations are not always um, constant as it is for example more in the municipal wastewater treatment plant. The concentrations are usually varying due to what uh, they are producing. The flow rates are varying and uh, the wastewater treatment plant has to be able to adapt to these um, conditions, to these varying conditions and it it shall never be that the wastewater treatment plant in the end limits the production because that in the end costs a hell of money for um, our clients. So what we are seeing here is the is the aeration tank here with the jet ejectors. We are not working with membrane diffusers. We are working with uh, jet ejectors. Jet ejectors have a really high alpha factor. That means um, it, it allows uh, that the oxygen comes really perfectly into the microorganism in the sludge. Um, it allows water levels up to 15 uh, meter and it allows bacteria concentrations, MLSS, for more than 18 gram per liter. Um, that is one big benefit to, to balance and enable shock loads because if a shock load coming or if heavy metal or toxic material from the production is coming, some parts of the microorganism will die off. If you run the system with 15 or 16 gram per liter and some bacteria die off, the system still can handle this. If you're having only six or seven gram per liter, um, your treatment plant will start to struggle with this reduced concentration. Um, as mentioned also, we are working with the external membranes. This allows us a lot of benefits. The external membranes also can handle um, like 18 gram per liter uh, bacteria concentration. Submerged membranes would start to struggle with that kind of uh, high concentrations. And also they have a self-cleaning effect because we are running cross-flow velocities from three to four uh, meter per second velocity. That means they have a high self-cleaning effect. That um, means they have a, a reduced uh, chemical consumption because we have a reduced cleaning sequence compared to, for example, submerged membranes. And for sure, we have a much less uh, reduced membrane area since our flux rates are six to seven times higher than in um, submerged systems. So this is the typical um, overview and schematic uh, picture of a wastewater treatment plant by Veale. Usually we are building a pretreatment with a balance tank. However, that balance tank do not have to be, for example, uh, has do not has to have the size of um, three times uh, of the inlet uh, flow from one day, which would result in a really big tank and a really uh, space consuming tank. It can be a small tank because the system itself can handle varying flow rates. And the main treatment here, we see the MBR bioreactor with the external ultra filtration as shown in the slides before. And then since the ultra filtration unit is producing completely TSS free particular free effluent, it's really easy to um, upgrade the plant, for example, with a post treatment polishing unit. It can be a nano filtration plant. If there is still a lot of hard COD in the effluent, we can reduce it by nano filtration. Um, if we have to discharge um, the effluent into a lake, uh, or yeah, lake or a river, for example, this is a really sensitive water. We cannot allow to discharge salts and high conductivities into a river. So therefore we would apply then as a polishing unit with the reverse osmosis, for example, to reject the salts. If we are um, entering the water into the sea, for example, only the COD and ammonia, for example, has to be reduced. Chloride is there not such a big issue since the sea anyway is full of chloride.
So this is a chart what we are seeing here. It's from a, a plant uh, in Russia. It's a Unilever in St. Petersburg. Um, what you see here is the, the red um, constant line is the agreed inlet level, which is in our contract. So the contract is for uh, 18,500 milligram per liter COD inlet, but the reality is always different. Um, on this line here, on the on the blue line, we see the real um, COD um, inlet level. So as we can see, never constant, fluctuating a lot with peaks up to 35,000 milligram per liter, and then comes the really important part that the wastewater treatment plant is able to handle such shock loads because such shock loads will be happening from time to time. They are not usually not avoidable uh, in the industry, not in the pharmaceutical industry, not in the food and beverage industry, not in the chemical industry. And that are all industries Verla is acting on really strong at the moment in the pharmaceutical area, in the food and beverage area, um, in the chemical and petrochemical area. And the important thing is why having that uh, strongly varying COD levels, the outlet, which you can see here as the purple line, is constantly very low and keeping the discharge limits. And that is a really, really big important factor for the client that he can have a good rest on the weekend and do not have to worry all the weekend about the wastewater treatment plant. Um, what we are seeing here is um, we are also doing upgrading projects. So we are not only doing greenfield projects, we also do brownfield upgrading projects. So we got called for a tender for upgrading a plant. So the, the blue Turkish uh, color here was the existing plant. You can see using a lot of, um, a lot of footprint. And after also here with a big calamity tank, usually they use this kind of calamity tanks if there comes off spec wastewater. So um, using a lot of space and then the Verla upgrade, we can see here in the rectangular green shape, um, really um, footprint spacing and very compact, not using big cal calamity tanks because the Verla system can handle that kind of varying flow rates. Also um, the system we can see here, is always um, adapted and foreseen for a modular upgrade because we are aware that industry is growing. So a client, um, if they tell us, um, can you please give us a quote for 200 cubic meter a day? We are doing this, but we always usually foresee for easy upgrade to 400, maybe 600 cubic meter per day because the production usually grows grows, that means the wastewater flow rate grows, that means the wastewater treatment plant has to grow with the industry, but not resulting in always having big, tremendous um, production stops because of civil works, etc. So the design should be smart and easy, extendable and upgradable in a modular design. So we see here in the Verla part, the external ultra filtration modules, and after the upgrade, or for the upgrade, we are just adding additional um, ultra filtration loops, which is usually done in two to three days. So as a summarize, um, what is important or what is uh, big benefits in our plants is the dynamic operation. Um, our plants, they adapt automatically to flow rate and um, inlet COD level. We are equipping the plants with uh, frequency converters, etc. Um, that means if there is a low flow rate a few days, then the complete system can adapt and running with a lower um, energy consumption. If they're coming peak flow rates, the system can or is automatically running higher. So the dynamic operation is a really big um, point in the industrial effluent treatment plant. It's a modular design. As mentioned the slide before, the wastewater treatment plant has to grow with the expansion and with the um, capacity increase of our client. For example, we had a, um, a project um, in, in Unilever. 
they started, for example, to do ice cream production and then they, they extended their production. They did uh, also other kinds of ice cream, um, Cornetto, etc. some kind of these ice creams. That means the wastewater flow rate increased and um, the job was to build a plant which um, is growing easily with this um, capacity increase of Unilever. And also, it's um, we are building the plant easy to operate. So usually, in in, in uh, um, our plants are running with um, one to two operators um, for one day. And usually, we are only having one shift, so there don't has to be operators during the night. Um, we always equip our um, plants with um, remote control. That means especially um, directly the time after um, the commissioning we can log in into the plant um, from germany um, to support operators and also we have the the Veale asia subsidiary daughter company in kuala lumpur where we also have staff and operators to send them easily within southeast asia um, this schematic drawing here is what we have seen before but here um, we see it in an extended version because nowadays um, a big thing is the zero liquid discharge. So everybody's talking about zero liquid discharge. So if this concept shall be applied by the client, um, we can fulfill this um, with the EQ tank, as mentioned, with the MBR system, the biology with the external membranes. With a reverse osmosis, for example, reverse osmosis produces concentrate. That concentrate of around 30% we are bringing to another reverse osmosis system. And that reverse osmosis system reduces that 30% to 5%. And that 5% will be sent to an evaporator, which produces 0.2% um, of, of like a slurry sludge is um, with a high viscosity and that is called as um, zero liquid discharge. However, zero liquid discharge has to be taken eye on very closely if it makes sense from an economic uh, point of view that we will see in the next slices. This is um, also uh, just a slide to show the the zero liquid discharge part. Um, this is from a plant in Russia. So we had a DAF, a MBR, and then we had three RO stages to reduce the concentrate and the evaporator. The DAF produces um, after the dewatering 2.3% and um, the evaporator has the 0.2%. This is in total a leftover of 2.5%, meaning a recycled um, water percentage of 97.5%. And 97.5% is um, uh, called as zero liquid discharge. Um, if we talk about zero liquid discharge, as I said, we have to look carefully if it makes sense or not. Um, because we have to be aware that if we having or if we look here in the horizontal at the recycling rate of the water and we are seeing here the money we have to spend we can see up to a recycling rate of 75 percent the costs are running um, um, linear wise and from 75 percent on they start to increase exponentially so this is a very important factor. Sometimes clients say we want to reuse 100% of the water. So this is something then we have to do a clear and a, a really detailed water mapping because in the end it can happen that to recycle um, one cubic meter of water um, with 100% recycling rate that this one cubic meter um, water to treat costs more than one cubic meter tap water. So if this is the case, then it is not any more economical. Some companies, there is even then the tap water cheaper than the uh, economical, uh, than the, the, the treatment costs of one cubic meter water from the plant, but they want to do it because they have some marketing issues, green company, etc., cetera, uh, some, some kind of programs, and then they profit from this. But um, if this is not the case, so it really clearly has to be seen on how much percentage of recycling the water makes sense in an economical way. 
So um, finally, I would like to highlight some case studies. So here we see a case study from Enz and Gaza. This is a project um, which we have in, um, in, the, in the greater area of Kuala Lumpur, south of Kuala Lumpur is a jam production. A jam producer from Italy started its production in Kuala Lumpur. That plant here we're having 8,200 COD and we um, have in the contract, I think it's standard B, less than 200 milligram per liter. Um, the real performance is that uh, the effluent, the discharge water is less than 30 milligram per liter um, COD, 200 cubic meter per day. And uh, in the tender, it was specified that the plant has to be simply upgradable to 400 cubic meter for the future. So like 100%. So the plant is already foreseen for an easy upgrade of around four days which we need then for the upgrade only four days for to increase the, the flow rate from 200 by 100% up to 400 cubic meter per day. This is a plant FNN French Chinese in also in Kuala Lumpur. Um, here we are treating 1,700 cubic meter per day. So by the way, the, the Verle uh, usually flow rates on plant sizes are from 50 cubic meter up to 5,000 cubic meter a day. So this is usually the, um, the ratio and the size where we are working in. Um, here we have also performances of COD, BOD and TSS removal of almost 99%. And here the interesting thing is um, that the plant was, it was a brownfield project. The plant was a conventional treatment system. And the, the issue was to increase the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant by 60% without touching any civil works. And that is where Werle uh, came into the game and we are converted the conventional system into an external MBR system which allowed us um, to be able to run the system with 60% more uh, than um, with 60% more capacity without touching any civils. Here's the project. We saw the picture already from uh, Mondelez um, Cadbury, with, which is a rather small plant with 50 um, cubic meter per day, really compact space saving design and um, located in an urban district. This um, was a plant from Unilever, St. Petersburg in Russia. This is the project where we have seen um, the chart with the varying inlet concentration. Um, we have COD almost 20,000 uh, milligram per liter, and we are reducing it by more than 92%. We have detergents uh, here in this project, which we are also decreed in the bioreactor. We have a plant in uh, L'Oreal, L'Oreal, a uh, producer of different kind of uh, cosmetic um, products, where we had to reduce the COD from 3,500 to less than 15 milligram. And with that client, we did such kind of water mapping and we came to the agreement that 75% of recovery rate of reuse of the water is the, the best ratio in terms of economical figures. In this, with this um, percentage, he has a really, really attractive operational costs and still um, he, he recycled back 75% of his water and he can reuse it in, the, in his own industry. Um, Verle is not only doing wastewater treatment, we are also um, gaining materials and substances back from the wastewater. Um, this is also a big issue nowadays because often a lot of valuable substances get, get uh, discharged with the, with the wastewater and it's definitely worth to have a look into it what we can recycle. So this is a plant in Mauritius um, and here we are recycling um, 70 to 80 percent of sodium chloride which otherwise without this nanofiltration plant they would discharge and remove and that are a lot of tons per um, uh, sodium chloride each day. Last but not least, um, a big plant in Thailand in Rayong. This is a wastewater treatment plant for the petrochemical industry. Um, this was also an upgrade of a conventional treatment plant um, by an efficient membrane bioreactor. It's the biggest MBR in Southeast Asia. Um, 
I hope that presentation was interesting for you. It was, uh, um, I hope I could give you a short overview and a quick overview into the, the necessity of a clear view into industrial processes to be able to treat the water um, economically reliable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bats. Uh, with a very detailed and interesting um, solution for the industry. Uh, now, you will, we also want to know the reaction of our audience after hearing all of the information provided in the seminar today. So, we come to the last final session. Can you throw your answer on the question appear on your screen right now? So, the question is what is the most important aspect for the industrial wastewater treatment plant? from your perspective. Still collecting. After the session, then we will start with the question and answer after the polling session. So still voting. We still have around 90 attendees right now. Active. Still voting. Okay, so the result is 45%. Um, the most important aspect for industrial wastewater treatment is robustness and reliability. And then 41% of the audience choose easiness of its operation. Okay, the last uh, point will be another uh, question shortly. What kind of industrial treatment plan shall be ideally built? Centralized, decentralized, or integrated? Last polling session. Collecting responses. Still collecting responses. Almost done. Collecting still. What kind of industrial treatment plan shall be ideally built from your perspective? Centralized, decentralized, or integrated. So now we come to the last result. So a 68% choose integrated. The treated water can be reused. Uh, well, 80%, 18% of the audience choose decentralized, which can be tailor-made to a specific industry. Okay, thank you very much for the polling session. Um, thank you for all your responses. Now we would like to open the Q&A session. Uh, may I uh, ask you, Mr. Simon Gotts, can you hear me clear? Yes, yes. Okay, great. I just testing my microphone. I had an issue before. So, um, yeah. Any question maybe from the participants? Um, if you do have a question, please kindly type your question in the chat box. Mention the speaker names and I will read them for you. Let's give them time. We will start with the first question. The wastewater needs normally a massive footprint. Can we roughly compare how big wireless footprint compared to the uh, other technologies, Mr. Brooks? Um, usually we talk about uh, 25 to 30 percent. Uh, of the footprint uh, of the Verle plant compared to a, a conventional system. So like one fourth. I see. Okay. And then um, the common use to treat the water, uh, to treat the wastewater is moving that biofilm reactor or MDBR. 
um, how do you compare uh, Lerner's technology, which is external membrane bioreactor to MBBR? Um, we see MBBR as a good technology if there is constant constant flow rate, constant concentration and more low polluted. When it comes to a high polluted um, wastewater, we have the problem that often um, biomass gets into the, the, the discharge water. So it's it's not uh, good equipped for or it's not good to be equipped for um, any polishing unit. Also, if there is a TDS uh, in the water, it's a problem because then the biomass does not really adhere to the carrier material. And also, usually the MBBR needs uh, two times more footprint than the external MBR system. I see. Uh, we have one question from Mr. Indra uh, Junaidi. Um, the question is, what is the, man the minimum capacity you want to handle? Talking about the this mini is not very great. The, the, the minimum capacity usually uh, is around 30, 30 cubic meter a day. So let's say one, one cubic meter per hour. One cubic meter per hour. Okay. I hope it answered your question, Mr. Indra. And then um, another question um, from Ms. Yulia Mariska, how do your company manage the other that comes from the wastewater? Pardon, how the company manage? The other. Ah, the other, okay. Other. Uh, the Thank you. Uh, this is also interesting questions. And um, since we are using closed reactors, um, there is uh, the order is really um, is uh, not going outside. We are collecting it in a pipe, and then often we have um, biological um, uh, order systems directly next to the plant. Uh, so you have your um, so it will be installed directly then um, besides the treatment yeah. plant. Okay. Any other questions, maybe from participants? Another question from Osa actually. Could you please highlight again what is the advantage of well external MDR uh, compared to the normal MDR with submerged membranes? Um, it's also um, the external system has also a much reduced um, footprint because uh, we have like up to um, 15 gram per liter bacteria concentrations compared to 8 to 10 gram per liter. That means we are um, spacing a lot of um, bioreactor volume. Um, we have six times higher flux rate that relates to um, six times less membrane area. This has an influence on the carpex, but also when it comes to membrane replacement, if you have to replace, um, for example, uh, 1,000 square meter or you have to replace 6,000 square meter of membrane area, this is a big um, cost effect. And also uh, the, the chemical cleaning uh, mm -hmm. is much reduced compared to the um, submerged system. And um, the, the holofiber submerged membranes often um, get clogged um, because there is not that high um, cross flow velocity or velocity and dynamic action on the membrane compared to the external system. Okay, thank you very much for the um, info. Um, someone is raising his hand. The man, um, his name is Mr. Abdul Muiz uh, Baharudin. Do you want to say something maybe in the chat box? You are raising your hand. Okay, maybe um, he will address them later on. Uh, we got some feedback and also uh, a request, uh, not request, how to say that. Yeah, yeah, the question from Mr. Bergus Pijono. Very interesting if your treatment of cane sugar industry. Can I contact you later? For sugar cane? Oh, yes, yes, please. Uh, we have two projects in, in, uh, in Mauritius where we are uh, treating effluent, but where we are also uh, reducing or uh, recycling uh, brine solution and a high 
uh, re um, recovering high amounts of uh, sodium chloride. So yes, please, um, please contact me. Yeah. Okay. Also, the email addresses and contacts uh, will be shared later uh, in the presentation directly, so everyone can um, get in touch with Werner directly. Another question from Mr. Imre Genaidi. Would you be interested to handle 4 mr the municipal wastewater treatment plant? Space is quite limited, he said. Is mun municipal uh, wastewater? Yes, municipal um, wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it's not usually it's not um, our business. However, if there, I mean, if there is a big uh, space constraint, we can have a look into it for sure. So uh, yeah, of course. Okay. Another question from Mr. Aldi Naufa. How much the average operating plus investment cost per metric cubic for recycled water from domestic wastewater? Let's say. Recycle water, it is for utility, utility water, um, for example, cooling tower. Um, How much this is French operating investment uh, cost? This I, I cannot answer because um, yeah, we are we are not acting in the domestic uh, in the domestic wastewater, and also um, it, this is not really. Um, to answer because uh, it's like uh, you want to know the, the the operation costs of a car. But then also um, the, the question is which type of car? Is it a Porsche? Is it a Toyota? Is it a Volkswagen? So um, this is this is the same here. Yeah, I suggest Mr. Adi uh, Nova to contact uh, Mr. Gotts directly. Maybe uh, give more details. What kind of plan are you uh, planning for? And then uh, um, maybe find a solution that together with Mr. Gotts. Another yeah. question maybe, we are still waiting. So while you're reading, um, we still have also another question from our side. Um, how difficult it is to clean the membrane and how often do we need to change the membrane? Uh, the membrane cleaning is is quite an easy is quite an easy thing. Um, it's a it's a cleaning in place. Nothing has to be removed out of a tank or something because the um, the the membranes are installed externally. There is a zip cleaning tank, and the cleaning only takes uh, one to two hours. Um, that's all. And the membrane replacement uh, depends on the strength of the wastewater, but usually between five five to seven years. I see. Oh, so it's easy to be maintained then? Yeah. Okay. Um, one question from Ima Dewayu Vijaya. How is the possibility of recovering the ammonium and phosphate from municipal wastewater treatment in a centralized wastewater treatment plant? I believe this question addressed to uh, Ms. Uh, Roma Dewanti. Okay, thank you very much for the question. So, uh, Pak Made, maybe you can see that because the uh, municipal wastewater, they also contain high concentration of the nutrients such as phosphorus and also nitrogen. So, I think this is also uh, the big possibility because usually like uh, urine, they also can be treated by a recovery process of uh, by added of the magnesium to form struvite. But this is still under the uh, experimental, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's wait for another. Okay, another minute. Treatment for high TDS industrial waste for question mark eight thousand to ten thousand uh, mega per liter. I guess uh, uh, are you interested? Yes, a uh, welcomed inquiry yes this is uh i mean this is actually um for for our plants not that high we are because as we are doing leachate leachate we get often faced with uh, tds values for t for zero thousand milligram per liter with chlorides values up to ten thousand milligram per liter so eight thousand tds sure uh, is a good number for for the external membrane bioreactor and with a combined reverse osmosis depending on the discharge how much must be the the discharge value but yeah if there is any demand um, or inquiry uh, yeah you are welcome to address to us 
Okay, then um, uh, we will get in touch with you, Mr. John. This was later on, uh, or you may contact uh, Verla directly, no problem. Um, another question to the crisis. How well will answer the challenging because of the corona crisis and how well it covers the after sales aspect? Uh, yeah, actually, I have to say the Corona in the year of the Corona crisis 2020, we had a, a lot of project income, especially from 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 Southeast Asia. I was not expecting this uh, beginning of last year, but um, yeah, in this year we we had a lot of. Uh, it was like maybe some some uh, uh, industries could not. I don't know, could not focus on the production and then they had time to look into the wastewater issues. So this was my um, impression. And of course, I mean, uh, traveling is uh, reduced due to uh, travel restrictions. So as all other companies probably doing the same, we had to uh, go on the digital, the digital way uh, via Microsoft Teams, etc. And also uh, we opened up uh, our daughter company, uh, Veala Asia in Kuala Lumpur, to be more uh, also in Southeast Asia presented also uh, during Corona crisis, yeah. I see. Okay, yeah, I think everyone still uh, has the issues and to travel uh, due to the travel restriction into Indonesia. So, um, another question from Mr. Ali Nalfa. Can where sorry, can Will MDR treat spend caustic from petroleum refining industry? So, uh, I believe can MDR process useful from petroleum refining industry? Yes, can can be treated. Uh, it only depends on the concentration of the spent caustic in the wastewater. So uh, also there, it would be quite interesting to see uh, to have a look into this a bit more uh, in detail. Yeah. Thank you. I will answer uh, your question then, Mr. Adinalfa. Um, regarding investment uh, and technical advantage, um, high per performance industrial wastewater follows normally with high investment costs and also high operational costs. What is the advantage uh, of, of real world technology in this aspect? Okay, the, the big advantage is um, the, 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 the perfect and um, optimized price performance ratio. So sometimes our plants in the beginning um, from CAPEX wise, they look, um, they look expensive. But if the client has a look then in CAPEX OPEX comparison, he sees that his return of invest is sometimes uh, less than eight months, for example. And mm -hmm. um, it's also really, really important that not only the electrical power consumption takes into consideration, also the chemical uh, usage, since our uh, plants are using almost zero um, chemicals. These are the hard facts. And also it's quite important to, to, to take into consideration, we call it soft facts. Soft facts are downtimes of the industry because they cannot produce due to a male functioned wastewater treatment plant. And that, costs uh, the client a hell of money if he has to stop mm -hmm. his production due to a not working wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, that's, that's totally true. Okay, um, do we have any questions maybe from the participants from the audience? Mr. Abdul Mouis, would you like to maybe uh, address your question in the chat box? Write it down in the chat box so we can read them out. What kind of, um, another question from Mr. John Biswas, what kind of pre-treatment do you suggest for industrial water with some silica and fluoride? Silica? Silica. Silica. Uh, depends on the concentration. If the concentration is not so high, um, no pretreatment is needed because in the MBR system, it usually some portion add to the to the bacteria and it will be removed by the excess sludge. If the percentage is higher, uh, it can be worked with the pH. So the, the pH um, can be higher, for example, because with a higher pH, the silica is not a big problem or it can be precipitated uh, beforehand. Okay. 
Another question, is it possible for some equipment produced from local water tank? Pardon? Is it possible for some equipment produced from local water tank? From local water tank? Yeah. Um, not, not, not sure about the question, but uh, we are working with local products. Um, uh, we have a combination key components. Usually we send from Germany, um, pipe work tanks, electrical works, etc. some pumps we are purchasing locally, yes. I see. Okay. Um, okay, can it be combined with Indonesian equipment that locally produced in Indonesia and somehow assembly with your product directly? Why not? We have projects in uh, Jambi Malang and Siduacho, and um, also there we have some uh, Indonesia, uh, Indonesian um, components. Yeah, we have no, no, uh, no problem with Indonesian uh, equipment. Okay. Another question from uh, Madi, from Mr. Madi. Is there a minimum of nutrient concentration to meet the requirement of conducting nutrient? recovery process since the domestic wastewater generally belong to low strength nutrition wastewater. I believe it's addressed to Ms. Pamadawanji uh, again. Uh, thank you for this one. Actually, as I mentioned in my slide, because this is uh, depend on the uh, molar ratio between the ammonium phosphate and also magnesium salt, so as long as they uh, can react to uh, uh, produce of the struvite and then with the uh, good pH condition and also uh, the molar ratio is suitable, so they will be produce of the struvite in the precipitation process uh, in the municipal wastewater because some people is also already investigate this kind of the recovery. Although the concentration again not, not as high as uh, industrial wastewater. Thank you. Thank you for the very complete uh, and detailed information explanation. I hope it answer also, Mr. Madi. Uh, last question from Mr. Bermawar. I live in Malang. Which project? Can I visit you if you don't mind? Uh, yes. <laughs> The, the plant uh, at the moment is in its last uh, steps of commissioning and uh, it can be visited. It's a, a landfill leachate plant um, from the landfill site in Malang and uh, uh, we are building the leachate or we did build a leachate treatment uh, plant there and uh, yes, it can be visited. It was in the in the finance KFW bank uh, program in within the mm -hmm. ERIC program, which stands for Emission Reduction in Cities uh, program. Okay, so it's supported by KF, uh, KFW bank then. Yeah. The project in Mana. Okay, I see. Okay, I think uh, we're still waiting for another two last questions. Last question from the participants, we still have around 80 participants active until the session. Last question, maybe. Pak Abdul Muiz, angkatangan itu. Yeah, I tried to uh, reach him, but unfortunately, I tried to unmute his microphone, and unfortunately, um, it's not working. Pak Abdul Muiz, can you maybe address your question in the chat box? Okay. Okay, I don't think that he uh, will respond to my, my question then. Okay, no question anymore from the audience. Last change. Last change. Okay. No question. Okay, then um, I would like to say thank you very much, Mr. Goetz, uh, for the very detailed and interesting information, Mr. Sobekti, Mr. Agus, Ms. Uh, Ramadewanti, for the very valuable insight. And also thank you to all participants in this online seminar. Um, as you have learned from our speaker presentation, this will give you an understanding of what the current situation is in, in industrial wastewater and domestic wastewater treatment 
uh, what alternatives Velo offers as solution and how the system Velo uses really help companies, especially in reducing uh, dependence on water use by the use of treat water, uh, wastewater again. So this is also becoming more and more important considering the large amount of liquid waste produced by the industries that can pollute uh, river water in Indonesia. So as you may know, at least 75% of the rivers in Indonesia can be classified as polluted rivers. In addition, uh, groundwater sources in Indonesia are also polluted. Therefore, contacting Rela at this stage to get more detailed information is also important to plan in the long term how to treat your manufacturer wastewater properly. So, uh, as also mentioned, they have even um, their subsidiary in Kuala Lumpur, so it's not so far away from us right now. Um, we can also have a range of meeting with well, or you can just uh, contact the well range of meeting with them. So, um, yeah, all right. Um, so, if you have so more questions about well uh, or other topics related to our guest speaker in this seminar, please feel free to contact us or our speaker directly. Email addresses and telephone numbers also can be found in the presentation shared after this event. Um, please note um, that the, um, we also have uh, many interesting online seminars, so we also have virtual delegation soon in the recycle sector in June, so please make sure that you are always connected to Econic via LinkedIn or even visit the Econic website. Um, finally, we ask you to take the time to fill out our survey we sent you later on. Your insight will help us to shape our future events. So after filling out the survey presentation material will be sent to your email. So um, on behalf of the German Indonesian Chamber of Industry and Commerce, we thank you for your participation. We hope that the information provided can facilitate your future plans in regards to the ways of treatment in your manufacture. Um, see you at the next economic webinar. Um, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.